Welcome to the Civil Self-Help Center's Introduction to Civil Discovery Online Workshop. Although the videos in this series may be watched in any order, it is recommended that you watch them in sequence if this is your first time viewing them. These videos are intended to provide a simple introduction to the types of written discovery that you are most likely to encounter in a simple civil case. In this series, we will discuss requests for admission, which are used by one party in a lawsuit to request that another party admit or deny that a set of facts are true or documents are genuine, interrogatories, which are written questions one party asks another to respond to in writing, and requests for production of documents or things, which are exactly what they sound like. We will not be covering depositions, which is the taking of a person's testimony outside of court, Depositions are not common in simple cases as they tend to be somewhat expensive. Likewise, requests for medical or psychiatric examination will not be covered because they make depositions look cheap and tend to be unusually complicated. If you find that you will be participating in any of these, the reference librarian may be able to direct you to additional materials that will assist you. On a final note, you should be aware that nothing in this presentation should be considered a substitute for your own legal research or the advice of a competent attorney. Likewise, neither I nor anyone else at the law library is your attorney. This should be obvious, since I'm an animation, and not a very good one at that. Simply put, discovery is the formal process that parties in a lawsuit use to obtain evidence from another party in the lawsuit. This process can sometimes be initially confusing, but once the basic rules of the process are learned, it should quickly begin to make sense. The first thing that causes confusion is the fact that discovery is generally a written process. Both requests and responses must be in writing. Although in some cases it is possible to obtain information from an opposing side informally by simply asking for it, a telephone call, email, informal letter, or in-person conversation is insufficient to compel another party to respond. This formality requirement ensures that both the requests and responses are preserved so that the court can resolve any disputes involving them. The second thing that typically causes confusion is the fact that the discovery process is done outside of the court between the parties. The discovery process is designed to be handled by the parties in a lawsuit without any court involvement unless there is a dispute. This saves the court's time and also typically makes the entire process faster. The third thing that initially causes confusion is the fact that it doesn't matter whether you are a plaintiff or a defendant. Each of the tools of discovery are available to you regardless of whether you are a defendant or a plaintiff, and each side might be the asking party or answering party at any point in the case. The fourth thing that surprises people is that either side may begin the discovery process, that the tools of discovery can be used in any order or any combination that the party wishes, and that it is possible to have all sides requesting discovery from the others at the same time. It is not necessary to complete discovery responses to opposing parties' requests before making discovery requests of an opposing party. The final point that causes confusion is that, despite the fact that the court is not involved with the process, the process itself is mandatory. If a party receives a request, that party must respond to the request even if the response is an objection. A frequent justification heard for not responding is that a party felt that the questions were intrusive, offensive, or because he or she simply didn't feel the opposing party deserved to know. Unfortunately, not responding can lead to dire consequences, including having facts deemed true, being compelled to respond, monetary sanctions, or other penalties. At the very least, failing to timely respond to a discovery request causes the late party to give up or waive any objections to the discovery requests. There are a number of reasons to conduct discovery. The obvious reason is to learn what evidence the other side of your lawsuit possesses. Without this information, you will not know how likely it is that the other side can prove their case or defense. If each side in a lawsuit is diligent in conducting discovery, they will know all or almost all of the evidence that the other side has, and there will be few surprises at trial. During this discovery, you will also learn how the other side views the case. Learn their story, so to speak. 
Having seen both sides of a lawsuit, I can tell you that sometimes each side's version of the events that took place are so different, the story each side tells would not appear to be the same case. If it is possible that you and the other side in a lawsuit view the case from a completely different perspective, discovery will allow you to prepare for the other side's version of events. Finally, conducting discovery allows you to obtain a written response from your opponent sworn under penalty of perjury that you can use to challenge the honesty of the party if the story is changed at trial. All of the discovery discussed today will ideally follow the same steps. One side, it doesn't matter whether it's a plaintiff or a defendant, prepares a discovery request in writing. A copy of this written request is served, either by person or more commonly by mail, to the attorney for the responding party or to a self-represented party, and courtesy copies are served on all other attorneys or self-represented parties in the case. This service is performed by someone who is over the age of 18, who is not a party to the case, who then completes and signs a proof of service form. If served by mail, a copy of the proof of service is served along with the request. The responding side has 30 days to respond to the request from the date of service, but receives additional time if the service was by mail. If the service was by mail and both the sender and receiver are within California, five extra days are received. Additional time is provided if the mailing is to or from outside of California. The responding party then prepares a written response and has the original of this response served on the requesting party's attorney or the requesting party if he or she is self-represented by someone over the age of 18 who is not a party to this case, keeping a copy of this response and the original proof of service. If served by mail, an unsigned original proof of service is served along with the original responses. Courtesy copies are served on all other attorneys or self-represented parties in the case. At the end of this process, the requesting party has both the original request and the original response, along with their original proof of service, and a copy of the responding party's proof of service if the responses were served by mail. The responding party should have a copy of the request, a copy of the response, and their original proof of service, and any other attorneys or self-represented parties that are part of the case should have copies of each request, response, and proof of service if served by mail. So when can all of this happen? The first limitation usually doesn't matter, but a plaintiff must wait at least 10 days after a defendant is served with the summons to serve a discovery request unless there's a motion that grants this. The reason that this is the case is because the plaintiff had the opportunity to choose when to file the lawsuit, and the court wants to give the defendant a few days to figure out what end is up before they get hit with more paperwork requiring an immediate response. As a general rule, however, plaintiffs don't usually serve discovery out until a defendant has responded to the original complaint because they're not going to want to waste their time and energy if the responding side isn't going to bother to defend the case. So this very seldom happens, except in cases where the parties are rather sophisticated litigants and have experience in discovery and expect the litigation and wish to push it forward as fast as possible. Discovery must be completed, however, at least 30 days before the first date set for trial or 15 days before judicial arbitration. No other dates other than the first date set for trial or the date judicial arbitration actually happens matter. So, so case management conference dates don't matter. Motions don't matter. Other dates in the case don't matter. Just the first date set for trial or 15 days before the date judicial arbitration actually happens. Now notice that I said the first date set for trial. This is because if a trial date is continued, discovery does not reopen unless there is a court order allowing discovery to continue past that first cutoff date. However, if judicial arbitration doesn't happen, then there's no discovery cutoff related to the arbitration. The discovery cutoff happens surprisingly quickly in most cases, so don't delay in discovery. Anticipate that there will be problems and try to complete your discovery sooner rather than later to make sure that you have enough time to handle any problems that might pop up. 
All of the types of discovery that we're going to be discussing today have limits on what you can request. The fundamental limit on what can be requested in discovery is fairly simple. Any discovery request must be reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of relevant admissible evidence. One of these days I think I'll come up with a jingle for this and we can sing along with the bouncing ball. Reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of relevant admissible evidence. But probably no time soon. Anyway, there's a lot in this sentence. Relevant. Something is relevant if it tends to prove or disprove something that needs to be proven at trial or goes to the credibility of a witness. Admissible. As a general rule, if something is relevant, it will be admissible, but for public policy reasons, certain things that are relevant will not be admissible. And we'll talk about those in just a minute. And finally, reasonably calculated to lead to. The analogy I like to use for this is fishing on the ocean with a net. Let's say that you're fishing for tuna. Well, you find a school of fish of approximately the right size, you cast out your net, you pull in your net, and if you did it right, you get mostly tuna. But what do you really get? Mostly tuna, maybe a shark or two, some random floating debris, hopefully no dead bodies or dolphins. But if it's done right, you get mostly tuna. This is the same here. If your discovery request is phrased properly, it should lead to mostly relevant admissible evidence. Despite this, not everything that will be obtained is necessarily going to be relevant or admissible. It's possible to catch things that are not relevant or admissible inside of your discovery request as long as the request is reasonably calculated to lead to relevant and admissible evidence. Some things cannot be obtained on the ground of privilege as well. For example, everybody wants to know what a person is saying to their attorney. However, that's going to be covered by the attorney-client privilege. Likewise, you might be interested in finding out what the other side said to their physician. Well, if it's not relevant to the case, it's going to be privileged on grounds of medical privacy. Some other limitations that exist that I see people occasionally run into is tax returns are not going to be discoverable. This comes from a state law that prohibits government employees from disclosing to third parties tax returns. Well, it was expanded to the court on the reasoning that if the government cannot give another person your tax return, the government shouldn't have the power to compel another person to provide their tax return either. Another limit that exists that very seldom comes up inside of the cases we see, but we sometimes see in the wild, is that in cases of a case for sexual assault or battery, you cannot discover the plaintiff's sexual history even if it's relevant. A list of other limitations accompanies this presentation.